Hello, hello, and welcome once again to our weekly Beatles news program, which is called Things We Said Today. I'm Ken Michaels. Most of you know me for my Beatles syndicated show called Every Little Thing, and I'm being joined by Steve Marinucci of Beatles Examiner. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Our uh, show today, we're going to be talking about a brand new DVD that just came out. It's a documentary on Beatles producer George Martin, and it's called Produced by George Martin, appropriately. And we're going to give our own review of this DVD. And uh, why don't we start by talking to Steve and uh, asking what you thought of it in general. Well, I, I thought it was very well done. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a, first of all, you know, it was shown in the, in the in Britain originally, so nobody over here has, unless you unless you were lucky enough to get a tape from somebody over there, probably haven't seen it. But uh, it's a it's a very well done documentary. What's really nice about it is the way they intercut his music all the way through it. Um, mm. There are all sorts of a, a variety of clips all the way through, and a lot of them Americans probably won't be familiar with because. There's things like the Goon Show. There's the Peter Sellers, uh, Sophia Loren um, clips. There's there's just all sorts of, a wide variety of clips that show how you know how outside the Beatles, George Martin, you know, uh, didn't just do rock and roll. He he did a lot of different things, and it really um, educates you to that. Yeah, I think that's the greatest strength overall of this DVD. It gives you, it shows you his background and everything that he did prior to the Beatles. And once you learn exactly what he did, the variety of recordings that he made, it, it helps you to understand how he was really the ideal producer for the Beatles because of the eclectic range of, of music. Not just music, but comedy records too, spoken word records. He right. really did a little bit of everything. And at the beginning of uh, the documentary, you find out that uh, the work that he did with the label that he eventually ran. He started out being a producer there, but he did the comedy records like, as you said, Peter Sellers, The Goons, and the Beatles were major fans of them. Uh, also, South American music. I mean, you never think maybe that he was involved with that, but uh, they actually illustrate all these different styles of music. Polkas are in there, jazz, Scottish country dancing is in there, and uh, a lot of classical music and orchestral music, too. So once you think about that and you hear some of these records, and some of them are kind of quirky, you know, you hear those sounds and you think, wow, you know, I could hear George apply some of this stuff on Beatle records. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's so many unusual things that the Beatles did on their records, and part of it was due to George Martin and the different engineers that they worked with. And part of it was their own ideas and just their willingness to experiment and try different things. But when I hear something like the end of a song like Glass Onion, for example, which is such an odd ending, and you hear some of this other stuff that George Martin was doing prior to the Beatles, you start to realize that it's not too far a stretch, <laughs> you know, from what he was doing later on with the group. Right. I mean, it's, it, it, you know, there, there's just the whole interesting list of projects that he did outside the Beatles before and, you know, even after, but, um, I mean, some of the, 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 you know, working with Spike Milligan, for example, is, is one thing. The, um, uh, he, 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 he was a major part of, I mean, he was producer of uh, Shirley Bassey's Goldfinger, right. which not too many people associate him with. And, uh, you know, to, I mean, that's really kind of interesting. The, the Peter Sellers um, Beatles uh, parodies. Um, of mm. course, yeah, I mean, that's not a surprise that he was involved in that, but it's it's so great. But Peter, he was working with Peter Sellers before that, obviously, because because of the goons, and also Sellers did, you know, Sellers did his own work with, um, with uh, did several recordings with Sophia Loren. Right. Who, in, in, a, in itself, when you think of that, you don't think of Sophia Loren doing comedy, but she did, you know, yeah. and, and and with him, and it, that was kind of, that's kind of you know very unusual too. Yeah, but there's a whole bunch of things that they play in that documentary that you listen to them and you go, you would never have guessed that George Martin would have even been a part of them. And one of the things that I found interesting was that uh, his comment in there about he wanted to, one of his motivations for making the Beatles, um, you know, for working with the Beatles and and making them successful was he wanted to beat out Cliff Richard's producer. 
Nori uh, Paramore. Right. Who worked at was, uh, Columbia Records. Right. He wanted to he wanted to have more number ones and that was kinda that was very interesting. But there's a whole bunch of things in there. You know, even even uh, you know, there's comments about the Beatles obviously and he's very you know, he's very candid about, about them. Which is really kind of interesting because, of course, Ringo and, and Paul are both in there. Um, I think he's always but, been candid about the Beatles. But you know, I, I, that one comment about John, though, about about John um, and uh, let, let it, it be. be. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure that he's ever he'd ever said that before. You know, the comment about I think I've heard the comment about him getting about the uh, the Christmas bonus. I might have heard that before. We should explain to everybody listening what, what we're referring to here. But as far as Let It Be is concerned, John said to George, we don't want any of your production crap. You mm -hmm. know, and, and George Martin also said that he felt really betrayed when John and George gave the Let It Be tapes to Phil Spector. Right. So and, he was, and, he was, and he was also surprised when they came back to him for Abbey Road. So, you know, that was kind of... That's that that's what Paul's pushing there, <laughs> right? You know, right. he's the one that called up George Martin and said, "Would you produce us again?" And he sa he said that John was willing to work on the album with with the guys. So, mm -hmm. and what was the yeah. other reference there? The um, the Christmas. So, well, the, the salary thing was oh, that yeah. when he when he um, became an executive, he no longer got a Christmas bonus, and he was irritated about that. But of course, I mean, I would, you know, you would think that at that point he was making enough money to where it really would make that much difference. Yeah, but, but the way the way he put it, you know, he he was responsible, and this is mind blowing here. <laughs> Just for the success of the Beatles alone, he deserved to get a bonus. But between the Beatles and the other artists that he produced that year in 1963, he held the number one position on the singles charts. For 37 weeks of that year, mm -hmm. and EMI wouldn't give him a bonus, which he says, you know, he, he carries a, a chip on his shoulder to this day about that. Mm -hmm. So that, that that is shocking, you know. He he did say that he didn't feel he was paid that well anyway at EMI. I mean, you right. just said as an executive you you think he was, but we don't really know what his salary was. But and there's no there's no question that. He was responsible for the success of Parlophone because Parlophone was not doing well before um, before he got the Beatles before he came aboard. Right. In fact, that was that was one of the you know I mean he knew what he was getting into uh, when um, you know they gave him Parlophone, and in fact the Beatles even when they were assigned him, I think it's isn't it Paul in the, in the in the DVD that says you know we were wondering why we got the comedy guy. Right. You know, I mean, that was, you know, nobody knew what they were getting into. You know, I mean, the Beatles were, even the Beatles were a little apprehensive about that. You have to give him all the credit in the world for, for what he did. You know, I mean, he, yeah, I mean, he was just absolutely amazing. Oh, um, yeah. For that. I think it's actually a shame in a way that, that Paul said that about George, that they thought of him as the comedy guy, even though George Martin is extremely proud of those comedy records that he made. Because he did all this other stuff as well. He wasn't just a comedy producer. But the way that George explained it, and this is very important to understand, Parlophone was looked at as being like the, the, the bargain basement, you know, label of EMI then. And they had two major labels, HMV and Columbia, and they had a few minor ones. But in order for George to have any kind of success with Parlophone, the, the major labels, HMV and Columbia, had the big artists. They had Elvis Presley, they had Doris Day, they had people like that. So he had to carve his own niche with Parlophone, and the way that he did it was by producing all these unique records, not just comedy records, but it right. made him stand out as a producer. He really, it made him work a lot harder, because he wasn't fed all, all the, the surefire hits of, uh, of other artists. And that also explains why he wanted a Cliff Richard-type artist. And Cliff Richard was the biggest thing in England around that time, right. and he was envious of the fact that Nori Paramore had that artist, and it was like, you know, there was not that much effort in having another hit record, If as long as it's Cliff Richard. The name kind of sold it. I'm not saying that the music was bad, but this is what George was thinking at the time. He wanted a, a, a group or, or any artist that would give him the kind of success that Cliff Richard had for, for Nori Paramore and for Columbia. 
and the and and while he was working with the Beatles, he was also working with Silla Black. He was working with you know, Hollow Jerry, you know, working with Jerry and the Pacemakers and Billy J. Kramer wasn't that far stretch. You know, Silla Black really was. She was a, she was more of a um, a pop singer than a, than a rock singer. Hmm. And um, you know, and and he had several you know kind of soft hits with her. I know there was one session where they did Alfie with um, with um, Bert Backrock in the studio conducting. And, That's um, right. And they showed so, that there. Yeah, right. You actually see yeah, that footage. Did. It's it's kind yeah. of grainy, but it's priceless. You know, mm-hmm. to see Silla Black in the the voice booth there singing her part. And then you see Bert Bacharach conducting an orchestra, and then he turns and plays the piano a little bit. Right. Now I've right. always I've always been told growing up that Scylla Black was kind of like the Dionne Warwick of England at that time. You know, I don't know if that's the right analogy to make, but it is kind of ironic that she recorded that song. She had a hit with anyone who had a heart, and both those songs right. were Dionne Warwick hits over here. Right. Right, and I was just going to say that I was just going to mention anyone who had a heart because, yeah, she was uh, she did do that. And I'm, in fact, I just pulled an old CD set of hers down. Uh, it's called uh, 1963 to 73, the Abbey Road Decade. I'm trying to get my glasses here to read some of the titles. Um, Alfie, of course. Uh, um, You're My World is another one. Um, she did Love of the Love. You know, she did. Um, Lennon and McCartney love a little love a little love. Um, right. She did yesterday. I mean, she did a lot of she did a lot of Beatles songs, obviously. And Step inside um, love. Step inside love. The uh, there's and there's a demo on this particular CD that I think uh, you can probably find on YouTube of Paul playing um, guitar uh, of a guitar demo um, of uh, of Step inside love. Mm. Um, I'm, actually, there's three now, now that I'm looking. There's three takes here. Well, there are, there's a bootleg that's been out for a while of of uh, the sessions for Step and Side Love, different takes, and you okay. can hear Paul on the sessions. There's three. There's three takes on this particular CD. Yeah. Um, I think they just issued another another compilation. I think a four disc compilation just came out. Interestingly, another track she did was "Shot of Rhythm and Blues," which. Um, you know, which the Beatles did. Hmm. Um, so she, I mean, she tried, she tried all sorts of, a few different things, but she basically stuck with the ballads. Right. Um, and, um, I mean, she, and in fact, the back of that CD has a picture of her and George Martin on it. So. Right. Uh, but in this documentary, it is, is nice to see her being mm-hmm. interviewed a little bit. One of the few criticisms that I can make about the DVD is that I wish that Jerry Marsden was in there. Even if it's just one quote, the same thing with Billy J. Kramer. You know, these are people that had a string of hits with George Martin, and it's nice to hear what George had to say about them, but it's it's just as important to know from the artist's perspective what it was like to work with George. Right. So, you know, that's one of the few things, you know, you mentioned Shirley Bassey would have been nice. I'm not saying, you know, a long interview, just one clip or something to represent her. Or in the case of, like I said, Jerry Marsden and Billy J. Kramer, it would have been nice to have that in there. Right. Yeah, it, it, it would have been. Um, and they yeah, also I, played, I they played a little bit of the audio of uh, one of Matt Monroe's songs, and Matt Monroe was a great pop male vocalist, you know, mm-hmm. very much in the, in, the, in the vein of a Frank Sinatra. And um, George Martin's production was just superb on something like that. So he also did that kind of work as well. Pop music and great recordings and, you know, great songs, standard type songs. He did a Matt little Monroe's, bit of everything, really. Portrait, Matt Monroe's uh, Portrait of My Love right. was, one of, was one of his tracks. And of course, he did America, the Tin Man for, for America. And they show that. Um, and he also played the piano part for that, right, which I didn't know right. before. And Dewey right. Bunnell said I, I, that in the in the uh, I, I, I knew that was part of his. Uh, I knew he had done something. You know, he had done um, some work with him. I, I, I'm not sure if I knew that they had. He had done Tin Man with them. He recorded several albums with the group. Right. But uh, you know, another strength of this documentary is the fact that it it goes beyond the Beatles. It goes after the Beatles, and George even said that he kind of felt relieved when the Beatles had ended, because it gave him 
you know, he, he was he had the uh, the freedom to work with any artist that he wanted to. And he also kind of felt like he'd already proven himself as a producer. He'd had so right. many number ones. So he would pick and choose the artists that he wanted to work with. And right. so you get to see some of those artists, certainly not all of them, but some of them. And uh, it's nice to have interviews with those people, people like Jeff Beck. He's in there discussing the Blow by Blow album. Uh, George Martin was doing that, which was extremely successful for Jeff. Jimmy Webb is in there, one of our greatest songwriters. Uh, right. John McLaughlin. All that adds to, it gives you a full picture of you know, the entire legacy of what George Martin has done. Yeah, and as I as I mentioned in my review, I uh, unfortunately there was a, a box set of his, all his stuff a few years ago, and I guess it's out of print now because the, the, the prices I've seen for it are pretty high. But there is a, a single CD called "Produced by George Martin" um, that you can pick up for a relatively reasonable price. Hmm. It has uh, "I Want to Hold Your Hand" on it. Plus, it has "Soul Black." Jerry, uh, the pacemakers, Billy J. Kramer. It has "Live and Let Die." It has several, a couple of Beatle covers: uh, Celine Dion, Dave and Jonathan, um, Peter Sellers. Plus, yeah. it has a bunch of other tracks. It has twenty-four tracks. So, well, I, I really want to hunt down the box set because I've never, I never bought that, but I do have individual collections. You know, the best of Jerry and the Pacemakers and Billy J. and Cilla Black. Right. So I have those, but the box set is something that I, I really should have picked up when it first came out. But, um, you know, this this is a tremendous documentary. One of the few things I was saying before, I wish that there were interview clips with people like Billy J. and Jerry. One of the few other criticisms that I want to make, and this is only because I'm a big Beatle fan here. Uh, George Martin's work with the Beatles did not end when the Beatles broke up. And they did, right. you know, he did quite a lot with Paul in particular. And the only one that they even highlight is Live and Let Die. And then George Martin doesn't even discuss the recording of of that song. And that song right. has become a classic in Paul McCartney's solo canon and a great live song, one of his best. And not to mention the fact that, you know, Tug of War was a, a huge album for Paul. And George produced that album, Pipes of Peace and Give My Regards to Broad Street. I don't expect them to go in depth on, on each of those albums, but there should have been some mention of, of Tug of War. And uh, he also produced Ringo's first solo album with Sentimental Journey. Right. So they really only right. focus where the Beatles are concerned on the group. In fact, they do, towards the very end, show uh, some of the recording sessions for Love and the recording that was made for While My Guitar Gently Weeps, adding the orchestration to that, mm -hmm. which is really nice to see. But they didn't and, really spend any time on the solo Beatles stuff. And I've heard criticism of Love because of the the altering of the you know the way they mashed up the Beatles and and all that. But uh, surprising how much that album holds up. Um, it really is. It really is good. Um, it it works. I'm not. You know. I don't know exactly why, but it does. It's great. It's well, great to listen to. It it helps when certain songs mix well together. Right. You know, when I first thought of Tomorrow Never Knows and Within You Without You, I thought, what? <laughs> you know, but, you know, they made it work. Something mm -hmm. like that. So, you know, credit not just George Martin, but his son Giles for, you know, right. thinking about certain songs that work well together. But, um, you know, there's so many great things that I could say about this documentary. And I think for Beatle fans, they're going to love the interviews with, with Paul and Ringo in there. But I think... There's one particular quote from George Martin that has stood out for me, which, you know, when I heard it, I went, wow. You know, not that it's so shocking, but I never heard him say this before. He said that he felt like Brian Epstein didn't really give him that much time with the Beatles in the studio. He felt like he was doling out time to right. George Martin and that it was like giving scraps to a mouse. <laughs> and when I heard that, it's like, oh, my God, I, I, I don't think I've ever heard George Martin say that before. But if anything, it makes you appreciate even more how much these recordings are so great. They're wonderful recordings. And there wasn't that much time that George Martin and the Beatles were given to record them. Right. It really and, and had to the, be done quickly. And the pressure they were under. I mean, not only the pr pressure that he was under, but the pressure they were under. Um, I mean, it, and because, I mean... It, their schedule, you know, their schedule, you know, in 64 and 65 was so tight 
you know, they didn't have time to, to, you know, as as they did later, they had time to, to sit around and, and jam the studio. They didn't have time, you know, early on. And, uh, you know, some of the things they came out with and came out of the studio with are just amazing. Yeah. It's not really said that often. The, the, the fact that they had to come up with two albums a year, you know, and an album like Rubber Soul wasn't even started till I think, October 12th of 65. You right. know, and they had to come up with original material plus the single, which wasn't on the album. <laughs> you know, We Can Work It Out and Day Tripper. They had pressure like that, but you never really heard the Beatles ever complain about it. Well, at least not publicly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is something we, we here in America, as it was happening, we never knew about this. You know, uh, they've uh, always, I mean, I, I, would, I would think that if they had any complaints about that, you know, even in the anthology, they held it back. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was kind of, that was kind of a clue that, you know, maybe, you know, I mean, they were human like anybody else and, you know, they had, they had a lot of, they, there was a lot going on. It wasn't just, you know, fun and games. Yeah. Um, and even Paul McCartney has said on numerous occasions, very often they would go into the studio and he had, John had just written the song and George and Ringo never even heard it. So they had to learn the song quickly. And when you watch this documentary, Paul even says, think about it. We were given, say, three hours in the studio, and you had two songs you had to finish. That's like an hour and a half for each song. So, right. you know, George and Ringo had to learn their parts and know exactly what they were going to play or something close to it. And so that makes it even more miraculous to me. <laughs> right. Exactly. exactly. And an another thing I want to bring up, and this is the only other criticism that I would make, and sometimes I feel like, when I talk about the Beatles anthology, it's like saying the same thing. I kind of wish that there had been something to represent John and George, interview-wise. Even if it was just audio. You know, even if it was just one clip from each to make it more balanced. Because I love the interview clips with Paul and Ringo, don't get me wrong. They add so much to the documentary. But it would have been nice just to hear John talk about what George Martin meant to the Beatles. You know what, now that you mention that, there was... And I don't know if you're going to agree with this or not, but to me there seemed to be a little bit of a disconnect on those clips with with George and, and I mean with uh, Ringo and uh, Paul, where they weren't going to. I mean, uh, they were there and they knew they were there, and they, but they weren't going to say. I didn't think those c clips connected as much, especially Ringo's. Ringo was just having a, a great time, mm. and Paul and Paul responded a little better, I think, but. You know, I mean, it was nice that they were both there, and Ringo did make the one comment about, you know, how uh, about uh, Sergeant Pepper, and um, you know, and uh, how being in the studio really, really got them going. It just seemed to me that there was a little bit of a disconnect. I don't know, maybe it's just my imagination, but um, okay, I think it's a valid criticism to make. It's just nice to hear Paul or Ringo talk at all about what went on in those days and with George Martin. There's a real nice moment in there when Paul. When they're playing um, an outtake of one of the Christmas messages, and it's just nice just to see the look on Paul's face or George Martin as they're listening to it. Right. You know, and the fact that Paul said, we tried to get George Martin in to say something on the Christmas messages, but he wouldn't do it. Right. You know, just something and, like and that, which I never heard Paul say before. Right. And I guess what I was comparing it to was the, the Disney Channel um, making a Sgt. Pepper where where he and Paul uh, took the outtake of Day in the Life and were playing around with that. And the both of them were really, really into it. And it just didn't seem to be the same. Well, for one, they didn't they didn't take any, any song outtakes, which was really, that probably, that would have been very nice mm. if they had pulled something out of, out of the archives. And they didn't do that. But that little, you know, that um, moment in... In uh, making a Sergeant Pepper, where Paul, you know, where they, where they, uh, where they're playing with uh, Day in the Life, and the, both of them are just kind of the, the look on their faces and the right. look on on, on uh, the the feeling of anybody who heard that for the first time was like, oh my god, right. that wasn't there. But that that that's, that's a minor criticism. I mean, the, the content of the DVD itself is is still very good, and hmm. it is what it is. It's a tribute to his to. Uh, George's legacy. And well, it is uh, nice to see Ringo in particular 
reacting to certain Beatles songs when they're being played back, like Drive My Car and clapping his hands or trying to, you know, capture what he did on the drums. Right. The same thing with Tomorrow Never Knows. He does that, too. And George Martin does bring up certain Beatles songs and they discuss it like Tomorrow Never Knows and Rain and, and uh, Yesterday and Eleanor Rigby. And that's nice, too. We should also point out that there are bonus features, bonus tracks included in the DVD. And there are interviews with people like Rick Rubin, who just says nothing but glowing words about George Martin. Yeah, some of the, some of the interviews um, on the special features are extended from the from the uh, DVD. They're, they're longer, so that's a nice thing. And T Bur- Bone Burnett is in there. He has some okay. really nice things to say. Some nice observations about George a- a- as a producer. Ken Scott I, also as well. Right. I wish they had. I wish you know they did not. However, extend uh, put the uncut. Uh, Paul and Ringo interviews on there, which probably there probably weren't any more, probably wasn't any more of you know what they said, but it would have been that would have been really nice if there had been you know the full clips of uh, Paul and Ringo, but there are not. Hmm. But you know, I'm kind of surprised. I'm really glad that Ken Scott is, is out there right now promoting his book and talking about the Beatles and the other artists that he's worked with. I'm just kind of surprised that Jeff Emmerich wasn't in this, right? Because Jeff but, Emmerich went on to do a lot more work with George after the Beatles. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm just kind of surprised about that. But overall, I would say this is definitely a must-buy for Beatle fans and something that you need to watch just to get a fuller appreciation of what George Martin has done in his entire career and also what really prepared him for working with, you know, one of the most eclectic acts of all time, I think possibly of all time, the Beatles, and mm-hmm. just everything that you that you heard before, just to hear these these musical excerpts. And the comedy right. records of what he was doing before the Beatles, you know, all of a sudden something clicks in your brain and you say, you know, <laughs> I can see why he was the perfect producer for them. Right. It gives you a much richer understanding of, of his work. Yeah. Uh, with the Beatles before, before and after the Beatles. That's right. So. so that puts a wrap on this show. If you want to, you can find out more about my Beatles program, Every Little Thing, on my website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com. And Steve, if people want to get in touch with you or they want to find out more about your work, they can do what? You can, they, you can find me on examiner.com, uh, search for Beatles Examiner. I also have, have my own Facebook page. And I should mention that we now have a Facebook page for the show. That's right. All things, the things we said today. And, and uh, feel free to um, click on the page and, and, and add us as a friend or uh, add yourself as a friend. And, and we'll have the information about the show and I hope uh, you'll all join us. Right. So thanks so much for listening. I'm Ken Michaels, and we'll see you next time.